call the council meeting to order. Please be seated. All right. Motion to reconvene the open meeting. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Um, the first item we have tonight is our presentation of the 2016 Burnaby Local Heroes Award. So I will be coming down to the front to help with the presentations and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Councillor Valco, the Chair of the Social Issues Committee, to uh, look after some of the introductions. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Your Worship. Uh, in our calendar, our annual calendar, this is uh, probably one of our more auspicious uh, presentation nights, uh, presentation of local heroes. Uh, local heroes are people who've made outstanding contributions to our community's well-being. And tonight, four individuals will be recognized for their significant accomplishments and the positive impacts they've made on the city and citizens of Burnaby. Could be a future local hero in the back of, back of the room. 2060, or a politician, that's right. <laughs> 2016 marks the 20th year the city has recognized its local heroes. The total number of local heroes in Burnaby, including the people being recognized this evening, now stands at 255. Local heroes represent an impressive cross-section of Burnaby citizens. Just to add, we're at a population, I think, of 230,000 now in this city, so this is a pretty uh, august group of 255 of our citizens. At this time, I'd like to thank our schools, libraries, recreation centers, and community agencies for helping to spread the word about the program. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to the people who took the time and initiative to put together nomination submissions this year. Without the efforts of the nominators, the Local Heroes Award program would not be the success that it is today. And you beat me to the punch. I'd now call upon Mayor Corrigan to join me in making the presentations to this year's local heroes. As your name is called, I invite each local hero to come forward to receive your certificate of recognition and to have your photograph taken. And so your worship, our first local hero, Khalid Boudreau. And let me let me, let me read out an impressive CV before we get into this. Uh, Khalid has been active in his community for most of his adolescence. Four years ago, Khalid joined the Burnaby District UN Connections Club, a network of Burnaby secondary students who work towards raising awareness and discussing solutions to global issues such as human rights and the rights of the child. The network meets in a UN-style forum and participates in monthly teleconferences with similar networks across the globe. In his role as leader of the club, he chairs the meetings, trains newer members in the protocols of model UN debate. Under his leadership, many Burnaby youth have been inspired to join and actively participate in the club. He mentors youth in Burnaby to become more aware of global issues and to be engaged and informed citizens of Burnaby. Khalid has also volunteered for five years with Spare the Cold Collective Society, a Burnaby-based charity that provides backpacks full of necessities and comfort items to street entrenched and or unstable house people during the Christmas season. Khalid has assisted with collecting the needed donations and supplies and putting together the packages for the society. As Khalid's nominators note, Khalid is a definite leader and his community and school-based work collide to create amazing motivation and inspiration and he deserves recognition as a leader in the community. Khalid Boudreau. Thanks, Khalid. I think we're in good hands in the future if we have more Khalid Boudreaux exactly. coming forward. Our second local hero, Your Worship, Hazel Cayley. For 15 years, Hazel has been an active volunteer serving Burnaby seniors and new parents through her involvement with Citizen Support Services. Hazel has taken on a variety of roles, 
from calling in weekly grocery orders for isolated seniors to being the team captain of a group of volunteer shoppers and organizing the shopping trips. She also shares her time as a weekly volunteer visitor to isolated seniors and helps with planned seniors outings. She has further helped with a program to assist new mothers with the care of their new infants. Additional volunteer work includes fundraising for the BC Cancer Society, as well as ushering at the James Cowan Theatre, the Burnaby Blues and Roots Festival, and the Rhododendron, Rhododendron Festival. As Hazel's nominators write, Hazel brings a truly compassionate, diligent, responsible ethic to her volunteering. She has driven in the snow to deliver groceries when the paid contractor couldn't, and has taken seniors to hospital appointments at the last minute. Hazel is that go-to volunteer who inspires the other volunteers on her team. Your Worship, Hazel Cayley. Congratulations, Hazel. And our third local hero, Your Worship, Brenda Felker. Congratulations, Brenda. Brenda has been an active volunteer in Burnaby for many years, seeking to enrich the lives of seniors in the community. She serves on the board of the Bonzer 55 Plus Society, which aims to maintain, improve, and promote quality leisure lifestyles for adults aged 55 plus in Burnaby. She's a natural choice for the society's liaison to other senior support groups in Burnaby due to her active involvement with many of them. Since its inception in 2007, Brenda has volunteered with the Voices of Burnaby Seniors, assisting with its advocacy efforts, organizing events, and recruiting participants. She is also a board member and current president of the New Vista Society, where she led the board in developing a concept to build a new care home on site. Between 1990 and 2001, Brenda was also active on two municipal committees, the Advisory Planning Commission and the Environment and Waste Management Committee. As Brenda's nominators describe, it is hard to think of how anyone could make a greater impact in the community and lives of the citizens of Burnaby than Brenda. She's very deserving of a Burnaby Local Hero Award because of her outstanding long-term contribution to community well-being and the impact her services continue to make. Ladies and gentlemen, Brenda Felker. Congratulations, Brenda. And our fourth local hero, Your Worship, Annette Voles, who unfortunately sends her regrets. She can't be with us this evening, but her two nominators, Pamela Cole and Lisa Moore are present to receive the award on behalf of Annette. Come on up. Come on down. <laughs> Not here? <laughs> are they arm wrestling? What's going on here? No? Well, that's all right. I'm going to receive this okay. award. Okay. Yeah. And let me just, uh, let me just read out uh, Annette's uh, CV. For over two decades, Annette has been an active volunteer with the George Derby Volunteer Society, where she contributes in diverse ways. Besides assisting residents at George Derby Centre, Annette is the volunteer bookkeeper for the society. She has also served as the gift shop shopper, assisting with stocking the gift shop and ensuring that items requested by George Derby residents are regularly stocked. She often helps residents with shopping orders and delivers purchases to residents' rooms. Annette also contributes to event planning at the center. She assists staff with planning birthday celebrations for residents, as well as other events, such as Remembrance Day ceremonies. During special events, Annette leads a team of volunteers in ushering attendees to their seats, providing special assistance to those using wheelchairs or walkers. Annette also assists with clerical duties related to special events as needed. As Annette's nominators describe, we like to think of Annette as our mighty mouse. She has great attention to detail, humble, 
quiet, doesn't ask for attention. She has her own drive and is 110% committed. Ladies and gentlemen, Annette Bowles. Oh, here we go. Okay, I got someone to get a picture with. Come on in here. Well, we also have one to add. Yeah. She also volunteers for Basin, which has a thrift store up on Edmond Street, and she is a, an amazing volunteer. And we came here here as her Just own cheering section. <laughs> <laughs> and she helps at the Burnaby Children. She was ill. And she couldn't be year. here. Yeah. 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 There we she go. She wanted to know we were here for her. <laughs> 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 Please. You know, that's funny because it's almost always the truth that we find out after someone is nominated that we've only seen the tip of the iceberg of their volunteering because it seems that volunteers often are compelled to volunteer in every part of their life and that you find out they're doing so many other things to give of themselves back to the community and that uh, is one of the great pleasures of being part of these local hero awards they they are one of the nicest nights for us to be able to recognize citizens who make a difference each and every day in their community and those citizens represent many other volunteers who are constantly out in the city of Burnaby making a difference for their fellow citizens, generously giving of the most important commodity they have, their time, to make sure that other people's lives are just a little more fulfilled. And it really does make a difference in Burnaby. And it makes, you know, I often say that Burnaby is a small town in a big city. And that small town comes from people just like you who are consistently out there doing something to help others and to make their lives easier. And tonight it's recognized by a lot of people who are here as guests who have come to congratulate uh, the recipients of the Local Hero Awards is that we have with us um, MLA Kathy Corrigan from Burnaby Deer Lake. MLA Raj Shohan from Burnaby Edmonds. And MLA Richard T. Lee from Burnaby North. I want to also mention that we have with us from the Burnaby School Board, Vice uh, Chair of the School Trustees, Harmon Pander. School Trustee Baljinda Narang. School Board Trustee Gary Wong and School Board Trustee Katrina Chen. And finally, we're lucky tonight to have uh, Freeman Egon Nikolai and his wife Fern. Thank you very much for coming, Egon. That's a lot of dignitaries out to honor our local heroes, and I want to thank you very much because uh, you all have busy schedules, and making time to be here for this event is very, very special. I want to offer my personal congratulations to all of the recipients. You've done a great job and are very deserving of this recognition. Um, and one of the things I know is that you're going to go back tomorrow and volunteer some more and just keep <laughs> working to make Burnaby a better place to live, work, play, and learn. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming out to celebrate our local heroes. And uh, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the council meeting. It just gets better. But <laughs> those of you who uh, have to get home for some important matter, this is a good time. Yeah, my wife is like a rocket. <laughs>
I should have uh, probably done this while we had such a big crowd, but uh, this is a, an important announcement and one that I, I wanted to uh, recognize tonight. Maybe we'll just get that door closed. There we go. The Burnaby Mountain uh, Golf Course received the award as Facility of the Year in the Lower Mainland. Uh, Burnaby Mountain Golf Course was re recently recognized by the BC Professional Golfers Association, the BC PGA. Each year, the BC PGA Golf Awards honors top achievers for excellence in the golf profession in 10 categories, including Facility of the Year. The winners are selected for their outstanding achievements, promotion of the game of golf, and professionalism. Burnaby Mountain Golf Course is excited to be the recipient for the Facility of the Year in the Lower Mainland, joining other regional golf facilities throughout the province, including Victoria Golf Club on Vancouver Island, Copper Point Golf Club in the Kootenays, and Talking Rock Golf Course in the interior. Located in North, North Burnaby, the Burnaby Mountain Golf Course has been rated by Golf Digest as one of the best places to play in North America. This popular golf, golf course boasts 5,800 to 6,400 yards of natural tree-lined beauty and gentle rolling terrain and offers a unique blend of charm, character, and serenity. The PGA of BC is an association of highly skilled and dedicated golf professionals who promote, play, develop, and advance the game and business of golf for the benefit of its members and the people of BC. Its members reach, teach and administer golf while providing strong leadership in the community through charity events and volunteering, uh, dynamic and savvy. PGA of BC professionals are available at more than 200 golf facilities, a vital resource for the future of golf in Canada's golf capital, British Columbia. So that's a tremendous recognition for Burnaby Mountain and uh, Mr. Ellenwood, uh, if you would, and Mr. Chu, if you would please pass on my congratulations to all of the staff at Burnaby Mountain Golf Course. I know that Council joins me in, uh, in giving their appreciation for the work and effort and commitment that's allowed them to get this recognition. I've golfed at the uh, Burnaby Mountain Golf Club and boy, it is really a, a top track and it does, consistently does among the top 10 number of rounds in Canada. So it's a facility that is extremely well used by not only our residents, but by people all over the lower mainland. So please take back my sincere congratulations to the staff. Big pat on the back. All right. And proclamations. We have a proclamation uh, for Waste Reduction Week, and that is being done by let me guess. <laughs> Who? Councillor Wang. There you go, Councillor Wang. I have a list somewhere. There it is, Councillor Wang. Thank you. Waste Reduction Week. We reverse the generation of uh, solid waste and the needless waste of water and energy resources are recognized as a global environmental problems and whereas local governments have an important role to play in promoting waste reduction, reuse, recycling, composting, and another, other conservation measures, and whereas communities, business, and organizations across the country have committed to working together to raise awareness of these issues during Waste Reduction Week. Now, therefore, Dear Corrigan, Mayor of Burnaby, does hereby proclaim October 17 to 23, 2016 as Waste Reduction Week in the city of Burnaby. Thank you very much, Councillor Wang. The next, uh, uh, the next proclamation is done by Councillor Jordan. Thank you very much, Your Worship, uh, Officer of the Mayor of the City of Burnaby, a proclamation. Great British Columbia Shakeout Day. Whereas the coast of British Columbia is the Canadian region most at risk from a major earthquake, 
And whereas a strong earthquake close to population centers would likely be the most destructive natural disaster that we could experience, and whereas on October 20th, 2016, at 10.20 a.m., British Columbia, along with national and international communities, will be participating in ShakeOut, the largest drop, cover, and hold on drill. And whereas drop, cover, and hold on is internationally accepted and recognized as the correct personal safety action to take during ground shaking, and whereas the City of Burnaby supports and encourages all individuals and organizations to actively participate in the Great British Columbia Shakeout and to register their participation at www.shakeoutbc.ca in order to be counted in the largest earthquake drill in history. Now, therefore, I, Derek R. Corrigan, Mayor Bear, Burnaby, does hereby co proclaim October 20th, 2016 as the Great British Columbia Shakeout Day and encourages all citizens and organizations to participate in the Great British Columbia Shakeout and then to endorse emergency management and preparedness activities that make our citizens and our community more disaster resilient. Thank you, Councillor. And the final proclamation from Councillor Johnson. Your Worship, this is regarding Foster Family Month. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, whereas thousands of Burnaby foster families provide alternative family care for children temporarily unable to live with their families and extended families. And whereas foster families are an integral and valued part of a team that helps children return to their families, live with extended family, or make the transition to an adoptive family. And whereas foster families from many cultures support children and youth to understand and cultivate and preserve their heritage. And foster, whereas fostering is a community responsibility and provides opportunities for all community members to contribute to the support of children and youth. Whereas the city of Burnaby recognizes care, compassion and unselfish commitment of Burnaby foster families. Therefore, yourself, Mayor Derek Corrigan does here, Mayor of Burnaby hereby proclaims the month of October 2016 as Foster Family Month in the City of Burnaby. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Right, a motion to adopt the minutes of the Open Council meeting held on October the 3rd, 2016. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favour, opposed, carried. Motion to resolve into a Committee of the Whole. And moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. The first report is from the City Clerk, Certificate of Sufficiency on uh, Resident Initiated Projects. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. Moving on to the uh, City Manager's reports. Uh, the first report is on the National Housing Strategy. Can I have a motion to adopt the recommendation, which is to present a statement for submission to the Government of Canada regarding the development of a National Housing Strategy? That's a move. Moved and seconded. Councillor Jordan. Uh, thank you, Bishop. I'd just like to comment briefly. Um, I don't know that there's a meeting that's gone by in the last several months or years, to, for that matter, that housing hasn't formed some part of the agenda. So, so again tonight, um, we have uh, an opportunity that actually um, people are talking very positively about because the, the new federal government, just a year old now, I guess, approximately, um, has committed to developing a national housing strategy, something that we... City of Burnaby and others have been calling for for many, many years. And they asked for input from ordinary citizens and, and governments and cities. And so this is, uh, in planning terms, a very brief report uh, because we have, have so thoroughly canvassed the issues uh, in the last many years. Um, and so our uh, planning department has basically gathered a lot of these things together and in brief form put forward 
uh, 15 recommendations that we hope that the federal government will consider in the development of a national ho housing policy. And the na national housing policy just isn't about um, social housing. It's about all kinds of housing across this the spectrum, as they say, right? So it's really, I think, important that this be um, looked at from all of the, you know, the broad uh, issues around housing in the country. And already the federal government has even taken some actions that I'm not so sure might be or may not be so beneficial in that area, but there's, they are starting to move on doing things like mortgage limits, rates, and things, because they, they feel that will have an impact. But um, but anyways, um, so this is our submission to that process. Uh, the public has been invited to, set, to send in submissions. There's actually a very effective for, uh, website, which I've uh, looked at, and as an individual um, commented uh, as a part of this process as well. So the process ends on September, October 21st, this, the end of this week. So. We had to bring this before council tonight, and then along with this, it's my understanding that uh, staff will be submitting our recent document that that uh, we put together about all the house, all the more detailed housing policy issues that we've developed in Burnaby over time. So I'm quite happy to see this come forward, and I just wanted to comment particularly on one recommendation. Um, it's number three on the list, and that is that basically in order to um, develop the number of rental housing units that we will need in this region over the coming 10 years, and according to Metro Van Vancouver, that is 55,000 <coughs> rental units of housing that are needed to add in the next uh, 10 years between 2016 and 2026, there's going to have to be some kind of impetus for market rentals similar to the programs in the 60s and 70s, which would give tax breaks or something like that to the um, to the private sector in order to encourage them to do rental rental housing, purpose-built rental, and market rental. And one of the, this particular recommendation addresses that and suggests that that's a good idea. But, um, and this is the game planneries, I think, but um, Mr. Palte tells me that by the wording here, it says, restore federal tax incentives for secured affordable market rental housing. The secured piece means forever, which is a piece that wasn't, unfortunately, in the agreements and the tax breaks that were given to the to the market housing in the 60s and 70s. So there was nothing that said that even though you're getting a huge contribution of public funds in order to build private market rental, there was nothing that said at the end of the day and the end of the useful life of those buildings that they had to stay rental. And so this recommendation in my understanding and what I hope for is that if the government goes down that path again that there has to be a commitment that because public money funds went into that kind of development it needs to stay rental for the future and then any buildings that replace it hundreds of years from now will again still be in that in that style and form of housing so we don't have the situation where we have today where where market rental housing that is basically been subsidized for many, many years, uh, then becomes for purchase and, and, and uh, no longer rental. So that's, of the 15 recommendations, that's the one I'm most uh, emphasizing, and that's the one when I talk to my colleagues at other levels of government uh, and other MPs that I keep emphasizing as well, because there has to be strings attached. when. When the government's giving away its money, and I think that's an important one. So, with that, I support the um, recommendation and the report. That's right, and uh, those units, that's why cities put in regulations, and I think it's across the Lower Mainland, that did not allow the conversion of rental units to condominiums because that option was available to them, and so cities cobbled together a solution to protect that housing by preventing it from becoming condos. 
because we were giving that power of approval and uh, and managed to protect them. But if it weren't for that, many of them would have just turned into condominiums and be sold. Right away, and some did before that before the um, you know rules were changed. Right. So the I think it's important to stop it now. Mention. Secure it. Make sure that, in fact, it's going to continue. Councillor Dollywell. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse I know me, you've been working on this issue at FCM as a director and as president of the UBCM. Is that there must be some satisfaction in seeing this come out? Is that it's a step in the right direction? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just wanted to touch on that. I, uh, I I consider this as a good news, albeit it's just what should always be, and so it's never too late to say thank you. But what really what has happened over the last 25, 30 years, um, the the housing stock has diminished, which uh, to a point where it, with the results in front of us, affordability is a big issue, homelessness, and people in the in, in the danger of becoming homelessness, homeless, uh, is because the governments have the order, other two orders of governments have basically did very minimal, very minimal which wasn't uh, really the, the previous uh, uh, way of doing things when, uh, when, when the federal government uh, of the day in the 80s, uh, uh, late 80s and 90s, just took, uh, got, walked away from that responsibility. So since, um, oh, I guess, we uh, realized that this has now come right fallen into the lap of local governments, um, we both at the, at the provincial level, at the federal level, uh, FCM, as you mentioned, Your Worship, has worked very hard lobbying over the last uh, decade to make housing as a priority. Uh, it was time and again pointed out to them that Canada was probably one of the very few, if, if, if the only, perhaps the only one uh, in the OCE, OECD countries which didn't have a housing strategy. Most developed countries, uh, have uh, a, a, some sort of uh, housing um, strategy which address the needs of, of their citizens. So this had does two things. Uh, FCM has pressed hard to the federal government to, uh, to, to have a, a dedicated funding because they had announced $120 billion over the next 10 years, which was previously $60 million, billion and then a new $60 billion. So the, the big city mayors and FCM has teamed together to say, look, there's a certain amount they have asked for $12.5 billion for the next to be set aside just for housing to just catch up and then pick up on, on an ongoing basis building uh, affordable housing, both market rental, both uh, market housing, as well as some social housing through this strategy. One of the things you worship that I really like the the proposal, which which hopefully will come through, is 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 defining the role of three orders of government. What has been happening over the last decade, particularly in British Columbia, I imagine right across the country, where the province has been pitting local governments against each other, all the local, oh, so and so is doing this, why aren't you doing this? And, and that has caused a lot of difficulties and, and, and animosity among local governments trying to say, well, we can't do it all alone because our neighbors aren't doing it and so on and so forth. Well, this was never a responsibility of local governments. So one of the, the things being asked in the, in the recommendation is a very clear definition of who is responsible for what part of housing and local government we always knew have a role to play in terms of both the uh, the application of, of the needs as well as the land use which was always there but it has sort of been bleeding into almost building homes for for, for the needs of local uh, local citizens so that part will be clarified and and also uh, it, it will give uh, much more responsibility to, to a crown corporation such as CHMC, which played a great role, big, big role in, in, in having affordable housing uh, through the 50s and 60s and 70s until mid 80s. And then suddenly they were not anywhere to be seen. So hopefully with this strategy, you will have a crown corporation such as CHMC, which will enact the role in both securing perhaps co-op housing, setting up policy and making sure that housing remains affordable. We should never be in this position again as we are now 
as you can see, that this has caused a fair amount of stress to the local governments right across the country, particularly in the lower mainland where housing prices have been really uh, mushrooming over the last few years, where it be the local governments are seen as not doing much, which was never supposed to be uh, the, the case. Uh, what we have done, it generally gets lost because the problem is so big. You could not, as a local government, make a significant difference to really what is a responsibility of a direct investment into housing, not only just the uh, portable housing, but also market rental housing. Uh, I recall sitting around this, this uh, council, Your Worship, it wasn't until about last year when we finally see some developers coming forward with rental building, but there hasn't been any rental stock built over the last two decades almost, and that is now what we're seeing. We are seeing there's a zero vacancies. We're seeing people basically now even pushed harder of, of, of the available um, uh, stock of housing because of now air B and air and B uh, coming in, those kind of things are really causing uh, a fair amount of stress. So, Your Worship, uh, this is a welcome news, um, and, and I believe it is uh, uh, how uh, the FCM itself has pushed very hard to the uh, uh, to the federal government, who to their credit have come forward. So, uh, thank to, thanks to the staff putting this document together. And um, and it would appear to me, Your Worship, something would come about in this, and we'll, that would be a good uh, day for, for for the entire country. Thank you, Councillor uh, Johnson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I uh, agree, concur with the previous two speakers. Uh, <clears throat> um, some of us that are a little older than others remember the uh, prior Trudeau era when Canada had a national housing policy, and um, the federal government, in cooperation with the province and cities were uh, building rental housing uh, through programs such as the MERB program and other incentives to build and maintain in, in um, rental housing. We also built seniors, they also built seniors facilities um, such as George Darby and New Vista and, and uh, offered uh, uh, mortgage guarantees and, and other opportunities so that uh, our seniors could have uh, proper affordable housing. The other one that I think is really missing is co-ops. The uh, uh, people like to have uh, at least a partial ownership uh, in um, in where they're living, and uh, those co-ops that were built up to 20 years now, are, uh, without this program, are in f are facing uh, the elimination of their federal funding. So they're they're scrambling to figure out how they can continue to operate. So I think this report comes forward, and the national this new policy uh, will come forward at a good time. Um, the only um, thing that I would hope is that the federal government has uh, strong operating agreements with the provinces. I know they're not allowed to constitutionally do it directly with us, but um, I know in the past uh, we've had federal governments giving money to provincial governments, including our own. Um, daycare is the one that sticks in my mind where with federal transfers for daycare, and instead of creating additional daycare spaces, that money went into uh, um, general revenue and uh, it offset the province's contribution to, to daycare, so they were able to use their daycare money to do something else. And I don't think that's what a, a national program is. If we're going to have a national housing program, then the various levels that agreed to put money into a program should uh, be accountable for that money so that it, we actually see uh, housing opportunities built and not just federal government subsidizing the budget of a province such as British Columbia. Thank you, uh, Councillor Johnson. I, um, I too am optimistic about this and uh, I think we're perhaps giving a little more credit than is really due. I think earlier when it was mentioned that it's about time, it is about time that we began a discussion on a national housing strategy. We're behind almost every other nation in the Western world. But that being the case, the time to start is now and to make sure that we start in a way that uh, brings together the best ideas and opinions from across the nation. And I congratulate the federal government for beginning this process and for being open to a, a national strategy, one that will allow us to start making up lost ground because we certainly are in a desperate situation. 
think everyone knows that now, and it's too bad that often you have to reach a point of desperation for uh, the provincial and federal governments to begin to act, but at least they are beginning to act, and there is money being committed, and hopefully we're going to see an increase in actual units being built on the ground, which is so important, is to start immediately to be able to get money into the hands of the organizations best equipped to be able to do this. And I have already, uh, in the latest meeting that we had as uh, as mayors with the Minister of Housing, uh, said that the Greater Vancouver Housing Corporation, Metro Vancouver Housing Corporation, is the perfect vehicle to be able to deliver housing across the communities in the Lower Mainland in a fair and equitable way, and providing an organization that's proven itself to be very, very capable of managing good quality housing projects in communities right across the, the whole of Greater Vancouver. Uh, so we've certainly said this is the ideal uh, vehicle for you to be able to implement early, quick decisions that will have a direct effect in creating both affordable housing and subsidized housing in our communities and uh, and I hope they take advantage of that because I think working with local governments and enabling us to be able to utilize our land use strategies to complement a national housing strategy will make a, a, a dent, an immediate dent in the housing deficit that we have across the lower mainland. So I think all of us can be optimistic but we'll, we'll see whether or not the details of any plan and the commitment in that plan deliver the kinds of things that uh, municipalities have been asking for. Let's keep our fingers crossed. All right, you ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Moving on to item 6.2. And this provides council with recommendations for the planning and building departments 2017 fee schedule for various applications for the purpose of cost recovery. Councillor Calendino. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a simple question to staff because obviously these are fee increases that may affect uh, the construction industry. Just wondering what's the distribution of this uh, report? <laughs> Mr. Pelche. Your Worship, the report has come to Council directly. We don't typically consult with the development industry on our annual fee increases. Okay, but do, do they, they can access it uh, in, on our website, I suppose? Yes. So they would be aware? It, they, they can be made aware. We have a, a meeting with representatives from UDI periodically, so they're generally aware that we do this each year. And when the applicants come to the department, we'll also be providing notices uh, once it's adopted by council that there are new fee increases coming for 2017 on the department floor. Just one, this is our standard practice, correct? And other cities follow the same thing that we do? I think so. Thank you. All right, you ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item three. This is to provide a report to Council regarding the 2015 Traffic Fine Revenue Sharing Grant funding. Councillor Kang. Thank you, Worship. Um, it's, it's great to know that this year we received $2.5 million in, in uh, this grant, and it's good to know that we are putting them in good use. I see that we are using them in tackling uh, property crime, substance abuse, and um, our RCMP drug section, road safety, violence. Um, as well, we are using it for school liaison to youth section. Um, one question that I have is, um, I was wondering what the formula for this is. It, from, from the report I see um, at the top of the page, it says that the financial certainty of this revenue stream enables cities to utilize this revenue source as a funding. And then I'm looking down at the chart, and every year we receive something different. So I was wondering how um, the formula is set and how we are receiving different grants, different years. Mr. Pelche? Director of Finance. Oh, okay. Um, the Klim chart. Uh, a three-year worship. 
Um, the traffic fine revenue grant that um, that was in place prior to 2014 has changed. So the, the provincial government ended the program as outlined in the report and a new funding model was uh, implemented as of 2015. So the reason for the change between 2000 and 2015 and 2016 um, was that as part of the 2015 grant that was provided to the city, uh, the province advanced um, as part of, part of the notification that they were advancing a portion of 2016 grant funding uh, as well. So the difference between uh, 2015 and 2016 is about $135,000. Um, we're not aware exactly of how they, which portion was advanced. So my presumption is that that represented the 2016 grant that was, was advanced in 2015. Does that make things any clearer for you? I, I have no idea what the formula is. If there is. If there's a formula. Um, I guess Neither does the finance department, so you're <laughs> even. Well, we'll sit down and talk more. <laughs> I think so. Uh, Councillor Jordan. Um, you were said this is a file I've followed for many years since Premier Campbell first announced way back at my first UBCM convention that he was going to give all the revenue from traffic fines 100% back to the cities. But a lot of things have happened <laughs> in between then and now. Um, and all I know is that the number, the money we keep Get keeps going down, <laughs> and then, um, and yet we seem to be having like more fines, and and now on top of that we have administrative penalties, which I'm sure, well, this has nothing to do with traffic fines anymore, according to the director of finance. So why would that be included? But anyway, um, I thank uh, staff for the information. I would like to also maybe refer this to financial management committee and make it. Do some follow up on. I will second that. What? Well, yeah. What's happening these days? <laughs> so you'd like to send it over to the finance and civic or financial management committee, right? Okay. Just so we can do some further inquiries. Maybe find out something that can, that <laughs> answer Councilor Kang's question because um, we can receive the report. I mean, this is just for information, right? And, All right. and we did get our $2,581,000. Good. But, um, <laughs> so you'd like to uh, amend it to add to the existing recommendation and refer to the Financial Management Committee? Second. Yes. All right, on the amendment, all those in favor, opposed and carried. And uh, I, I think, you know, I, I think it's important that we sort out exactly how this, this money is coming in, but I also wanted to mention that many of the municipalities who've received this fine revenue have simply put it into their, uh, their general finances. And we stand out because we took this money and we put it into policing, which is what the government wanted municipalities to do. What they had requested was that this money go into policing and supplement policing programs. We did that and we put it directly into policing right from the very beginning. And sometimes you're not given credit for your relationship with the provincial government in the sense that a request like that was honored without any requirement, without us being put in a position where they required us to put it into those programs they requested and we did put it into those programs. And so the augmentation of those programs has been directly benefited by the traffic fine revenue that's coming into the city. So this isn't something that we have been taking and utilizing to reduce our tax. This has been something we brought in to enhance policing. And I think that's a, an important distinction. And I, I wish more cities had taken that approach, but given that we did is that I think the province should recognize it's important for us to recognize too where this money is coming from and how it's being apportioned and whether it's being apportioned fairly, which is one of the critical elements is to understand and say, well, at least we're getting our fair share because no longer is it all of the fine revenue. It seems to be just a number that's kind of plucked from the air. And uh, I think we deserve a, a better explanation, although I'm always reluctant to 
look a gift horse in the mouth. In this case, I think we need to know exactly how the apportionment occurs. All right, you ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item four. This provides council with information on construction activity as reflected by the building permits that have been issued for the subject period of September 1st to September the 30th. Councillor Calendino. I thank you, Your Worship. I've been looking at the fares carefully last night while I was falling asleep and I noticed something. You know, we are um, generally uh, pointed to as a huge growth of high rises in our town centers, but I look at the figures here and the actually it's the single family uh, uh, construction is much greater than the multifamily construction, which is very unusual. I didn't expect that. It's almost 50% more in value than uh, multiple family uh, residences. So uh, even though we are having some high rises uh, being built in our city, the single family are still the greatest number that are being built in our city. So the perception out there is that we're uh, having a jungle of high rises, but no, we're, we're not. The single family houses are growing faster than the multiple family. Even though they may be replacement, we have more single family being built than multiple family. That's interesting statistics. Yeah. All right, is there anything else? You ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Moving on to item uh, five. This is to award a construction contract for the mechanical and electrical upgrade to the data, data center at City Hall. And I will mention, uh, Mr. Manager, that center is spelled wrong. Ready for the uh, question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. I know the computers are betraying us. We're losing our Canadian language. This is to request uh, funding approval for the electrical services vehicle. Ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item seven. This is to obtain council approval to award a contract for the supply and delivery of an articulating four-wheel drive loader. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item eight. This is to obtain council approval for a one-year contract extension for the supply and delivery of gasoline diesel biodiesel and related fuel products. Councillor Balco? Yeah, I just, I just make an observation. I've, I've noticed in various reports in different uh, media outlets that uh, our refinery here in Burnaby is up for sale and it's the uh, last remaining refinery in, uh, in the lower mainland supplies about, I don't know, I think it's 40% of the requirements for the province. I'm just curious, I'm not asking for anything, but if any any members of staff have had any discussions in regards to this and what the plan is if that place ever does get sold and and it gets closed down, uh, what's the outcome as far as where, where does the Lower Mainland start getting the supplies from? That's just my, just an observation, I'm just curious. Yeah, it's, uh, it is a concern because it's a major supplier for British Columbia and uh, it's ironic that we're going to end up in a situation where we're being expected to ship all of this oil out of our port with none of it staying here for the refineries in British Columbia and all of it going overseas to be sold back to us as a refined product. I, uh, you know, and, and those people you, you know, I, I know very often you get on the, on the internet and all the trolls that are on the internet say, well, if you use gasoline, if you use fuel, how can you possibly be opposed to any of these products? Well, because we're not the ones who are going to get to use it. And the reality is it's being just sent offshore. And the reality is that refinery after refinery is closed down. I don't know if that's going to be the result of the Chevron refinery, but certainly Chevron doesn't get out of what they consider to be a lucrative business. And I have to question whether or not uh, Chevron is getting out of the business because the National Energy Board refused to guarantee them a supply of oil to be able to run their, their refinery. I suspect that if you looked underneath it all, 
that that's what you find would be the explanation. When they lost that application to get a guaranteed supply at market price of oil through the pipeline, they lost the incentive to continue to operate that refinery. And I think with them being put in a position of having to get their um, crude oil in by rail or by truck, is that it makes it a much less lucrative operation for them. So, you know, there's some questions to be asked by inquiring minds as to exactly how much the National Energy Board actually is interested in maintaining domestic oil supply. All right. Question. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. This is to inform council of a request to construct a new single family dwelling under existing zoning within the Winston government industrial area at 3926 Phillips Avenue. Question. Questions called, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. Motion for the committee to rise and report. So moved. All those in favor, opposed, carried. A motion to adopt the report of the committee. So all those in favor, opposed, and carried. Bylaws, Councillor Jordan, please. Right, Mr. Mayor, it's my turn. Um, so, for first reading, I move that Burnaby Zoning Bylaw 13639 be now introduced and read a first time. Second motion. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, opposed, carried. For first, second, and third reading, I would move that Burnaby Taxation Bylaw 13654. Burnaby Capital Works Bylaw 13655 and Burnaby Highway Closure Bylaw 13656 be now introduced and read three times. Second motion. Moved and seconded. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, carried. For second and third reading, I move that Burnaby Business Bylaw, Business License Bylaw 13653 be now read a second time and a third time. Second motion. Moved and seconded. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. For consideration and third reading, I move that Burnaby Zoning Bylaw 13631 be now considered and read a third time. Second motion. Moved and seconded. Discussion? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. And last, for reconsideration and final adoption, I move that Burnaby Zoning Bylaw 13527 be now reconsidered, finally adopted, signed by the Mayor and the Clerk, and the corporate seal affixed thereto. Second motion. Moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. Do we have any uh, new business? Councillor Jordan. Um, thank you again. Just a couple of items in the purple pages, the correspondence. Um, as we've been talking so much about housing lately, we haven't talked about much about transit. And item number H is a correspondence from a coalition of Vancouver neighborhood associations speaking out against uh, the proposals for increased property taxes for TransLink and increased density uh, related fees and things for TransLink. And Mr. Mayor, we haven't really had an update at this council table in some time from what the Mayor's Council and the TransLink Board have, have put forward and they've got a new 10-year plan and opportunities to fund it. I don't so I think maybe it would be a good idea if we did have some kind of a, an update on where well, I know you live it, and I hate to remind you about it all after every one of those horrible meetings, but uh, you know, I think it would be important for us as a city to know what they're planning to do to us next. That would be a, a good idea. We can uh, we can get a report brought forward from staff on that issue and uh, and make sure everybody is aware of uh, what the proposal is. It is very recent. They're only out on a consultation now. Right. 
Um, we'll all be receiving more information about it because part of the consultation process will be uh, contacting cities, but they are actively out there discussing it and it involves uh, you know, a significant amount of additional money going into TransLink, DCCs being added to uh, development at or around transit stations, uh, additional property taxes. As you know, I voted against it, but I was, I think, alone in voting against it. Um, a lot of the mayors are, again, given the province refusal to look at any other funding mechanism, are saying that we have to suck it up and put it onto property taxes. I'm not supportive of doing that, and I haven't been in the past. And, and at one point, to be honest, uh, the mayor has voted unanimously not to have property taxes receive any more of the burden of, uh, of TransLink. But opinions obviously have changed since then. And uh, now they're pushing ahead under the leadership of Surrey and Vancouver. For uh, for more money to go into into transit, and uh, I I personally think this is only the beginning. That uh, this was just a knock on the door to see how the public reacts to more taxes being added onto their property. I don't know how the reaction is going to be. I think the the public is getting tired of hearing this and are being lulled into submission uh, that they they can't fight it. That even though they they voted against more taxes in the referendum. There's a, a way to circumvent that and to come back with a new set of taxes. So it's frustrating and I find those meetings frustrating and that's probably why I don't bring them up here as often as I probably should. I'm trying to retain some reasonable level of blood pressure. So uh, I, uh, but staff can bring a report in and say where we are and what the plan entails and uh, exactly what to expect from it. But remember that all of this now is being broken down into phases. So there are these incremental increases that are attached to phase and they promise the whole picture, but the actual monies that you put in only get you a piece of that picture. So it's a little bit like, um, it's a little yes, bit like timeshare sales. <laughs> so you, you never really have the full picture of exactly what this is gonna cost you. So yeah, I'll, I'll uh, ask for staff to bring in a report, Mr. Pelche, and make sure that we get council brought up to date at the next meeting. I'm just thinking it will be in uh, Council Volca. When did you get your letter from BC Assessment last year? Just before uh, Christmas? Just before Christmas. Uh, so we'll be, so we'll have another, you know, many thousands of Burnaby residents just before Christmas getting that warning letter from, from BC Assessment that, about how high their assessed value of their homes went up in the, since July 1 of last year to July 1 of this year. And I'll bet it's double. And, and then you add on this and you add on that and, you add, and, and then I understand UBCM did not support our resolution to to look at the homeowner grant situation, so no one cares about that outside the lower mainland. So um, we're going to have some pretty interesting uh, responses to property taxation from citizens, and this is a piece of that action that I think is is people are misjudging at what level the temperature is around that around those issues in our communities. So. And one more thing is that the assessments are provincial responsibility and they'll be coming out. We've asked the province to try and balance those assessments and make sure that they're not going to have that kind of impact. But I suspect uh, maybe they'll find something to do now because we got an election in May and they're not going to be happy to be going out and telling everybody that there are massive increases in their, their house That's prices. Value, so, yeah. It's uh, hopefully there'll be some other some other solution coming out of it by that point, but we'll we'll get a report anyway. Now, also for those of you going to Council of Councils on Saturday, they're going to be doing an update on the TransLink plan there, so you'll get more information. I think um, my impression was that this was an effort to sell all of the councillors across the Lower Mainland. And what they've done is basically gone in municipality, municipality to tell them all the things they're going to get if they support this. And uh, 
Yeah, so, you know, the realistically, many of those promises are a decade off, but, you know, in this guy. Never, never discard a good promise. All right, so uh, we'll get that report for you. Thank you. Councillor Balco. Thanks, uh, Your Worship. It's very brief. I just wanted to add them to her uh, words for the not golf course one. I just wanted to let people also know that you don't have to be a golfer if you put a facility that works for the not golf course. The city, and in particular, our catering staff and our head of catering. Over the last 18 months uh, since the city's been running the uh, restaurant and uh, also the pub there, it's a lovely little place and I used to go there quite a bit and after Councillor Jordan's warning about my assessments, I think I know where I'll be going to drown my sorrows when I get that little advance letter. So again, I highly recommend uh, uh, Burning Bee Mountain, not just for golfers, but for members of the public. It's a uh, Great little place to go, and you can watch the golfers, uh, but from the comfort of a lovely appointed uh, restaurant and, and a pub. So. Yeah, they won. Uh, they won a Dine Out BC right. award for uh, for the little restaurant at uh, at the Burnaby Mountain Golf Course. So pretty impressive. Is uh, staff there are doing a great job? It's a fabulous facility. Yeah. Councillor Johnson. Yeah, where is it? Just to follow up on the. I think one thing that you uh, mentioned there, which is really important, is that the assessments were done last July. People are going to get them in November, December. And they reflect the value of real estate in the middle of the summer when it was perking before the, uh, the new tax was brought in. Uh, in some cases, people's properties have taken a bit of a dive, and yet because of how the system set up with BC assessment, they're going to be taxed based on their value in July. So I think there's going to be a little more, a little more uh, of an issue there than what people expect. Um, the other one on the TransLink, um, the TransLink issue, the, uh, they're, they're mentioning, I think it's $4 per household on an average uh, household. Um, I think you'll find with the property values in Greater Vancouver that the average household is probably Maple Ridge or Lang East Langley or something, that anybody basically west of that is going to pay much more than $4. So it's kind of a misleading way to, to sell. Well, and I think it's intentional oh, sure that it's it done that way. Sure and the, they don't give a home on the west side of Vancouver or in Burnaby or in the North Shore as an example of the impact. And uh, and we all know yeah. that condominiums have been artificially low in yeah. price compared to single family homes. So there's a huge burden being transferred onto single family homes as a result of the assessment difference. And uh, that again will be part of the, the problem. I just want to remind everybody out there that the BC Assessment Authority is the provincial okay. government organization and phoning my office to complain about your assessment doesn't do much good. Yeah. Now, I don't think that'll stop anybody, but it is true that, uh, that it is the provincial government that determines those assessments. And I think uh, most of us around the region would handle it much differently if we were given the opportunity. Uh, and Councillor Volkow, you had another item? No, I'm sorry. Uh Turn myself out there. All right. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Thank you very much to uh, council and staff and everybody who was here with us tonight.